Hello. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, I'll let you know that if you go to Tattered Cover, you need to go to the clearance section, the discount sections where they don't sell the books they don't sell. That's where you get the non-left, non-woke stuff. So you got to walk down a flight of stairs into the dark dungeons, and then you, it's just shelves of, upon shelves of books for $4. So it's a good, it's a good deal. So uh, this talk, I'm giving a presentation on left libertarianism. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it or not. I don't know how many of you are aware that there was a left-wing orientation to libertarianism as a political philosophy in the first place. Uh, but this is going to be a bit of an introduction to that. Um, I I'm trying to cover a fair bit of ground, so I'm not able to dive, you know, too deep into any of it, but if you have any questions about any any of it, any nuances, please ask in the Q&A, and I'll do my best to answer. So I'd like to um, give this presentation and explain why I'm giving this presentation um, before I get right into it. And a big reason is that, at least in the United States, libertarianism is considered a conservative cultural movement. Right? There's a lot of overlap with conservative culture, uh, things like focus on money and banking, things like guns, things like taxes. There's a lot of common ground with conservatives. Um, and people are not often aware that there are uh, distinct leftist strands of libertarianism that are perhaps in, in some sense equally compelling or equally have historical importance to what we understand in America as a libertarian movement. And so I'd like to give a bit of a primer and share with you guys and, uh, and help to help you to, 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 to understand a different way to think about anti-statism and a different way perhaps to work with people that don't share your values necessarily, but sh might share your means, right? They might want different things, but they also might want to reduce the state for their own purpose, and that actually is a, a profitable uh, partnership there. So I'll just start quickly at the little quick history of the word libertarian. And as far as the you know, word itself goes, I mean, the ideas go back for hundreds of years, but as far as the word itself, the first recorded usage seems to be about 1800, um, just to describe people that defend social political liberty sort of generally. Uh, it isn't until about 1850 we get to about a specific political philosophy, and that's in France, um, and that's between um, de Jacques and Proudhon, and so it becomes you, you know, originally describing a kind of voluntary communism is the word that they use. You know, they use the word libertarian to describe what they're what they're promoting. Um, and then throughout the 19th century, it got sort of clustered and uh, grouped together with other types of anti-authoritarian and anti-capitalist left-wing movements, and it became essentially just anarchists. And so, in the 19th century, you have different types of green anarchists and labor anarchists and different types of anti-state, anti-capitalist groups, and they're just generally considered libertarian. Uh, and you have folks like Lazarus de Spooner and Benjamin Tucker in the late 19th century that are writing uh, and using the word liberty and using the word libertarian to describe their individualist anarchist positions. Uh, and then something kind of strange happened. In America, in around the, around the 1950s, libertarian ended up being sort of co-opted by a small government, um, sort of conservative political sort of group and you see this expressed uh, through sort of the old right. So if you ever read Chodorov, or you read Albert J. Nock, you read these guys in the 20s and 30s, Mankin a little bit, they don't really use the word libertarian, but until the 40s or 50s, then they start to use it. Um, and it describes something a little bit different. Um, and so there is a bit of a, a bifurcation in what the word means to different groups. And so that bifurcation is also the same bifurcation that we have with the word capitalism. Right? So capitalism, as we all in this room understand it, presumably, is a system of free enterprise and free trade and private property and, and, and so forth. Right? Well, uh, that is not how people use capitalism in Europe and historically. And so we have a sort of isolated definition in America around both of those words, libertarian and capitalism. So um, in, this, in this presentation, I'll do my best to speak in the understanding that we have you know, as Americans, as, as, you know, as modern libertarians, but just wanted you guys to keep in mind that the uh, title of the talk, Free Market Anti-Capitalism, is going to refer to capitalism used in a traditional Marxist sense of a system of political power acquired by a capitalist class for their own benefit. 
So just to, as a sort of keep that in mind, I don't want anybody to need to cross any wires. So before I get into left versus right libertarianism, I wanted to spend a moment talking about thick versus thin libertarianism. And I don't know how many folks are familiar with this, but we can think about this distinction uh, as, as, as someone supporting thick libertarianism or, or supporting a thin libertarian position as a question of what else is involved in commitments with libertarianism. So a thin libertarian views libertarianism as a single strand, as a sort of standalone, right? I have a commitment not to, commi not to initiate force on peaceful, innocent people, and presumably not to defraud people and not to advocate for force used against them, and that makes me a libertarian by definition. Well, there are lots of groups that are, uh, have a thicker conception of libertarianism. and say, well, that's well and good, that's necessary as a nucleus, but you also should support these attendant cultural items and social elements and philosophical values that go along with it. Uh, and so, um, I'm sure, I'm sure if we were to have a deep survey and poll, people would differ on exactly where that is, right? What kind of cultural commitments do you need, you know, either conceptually uh, or pragmatically, right? Could you have libertarianism in Somalia? Technically, practically, well, I don't know. Uh, and so I wanted to introduce this idea because thick versus thin is really orthogonal to left versus right. There are thick right-wing libertarians, and I think of Hanselman Hoppe as a good example of that. Right? He has his, if anybody here has read Hoppe on democracy or on other notions, they know that he has some specific cultural values that he wants to be associated with libertarianism. Um, and we have thick libertarians on the left, uh, folks like Roderick Long, I would consider. And then we have thin libertarians on the right, people like Walter Block, right? It says, no, 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 fuck all that, forget all you stupid, all this religious stuff or social culture, it's like literally this is all that it is, and anything else is just super derogatory, it's all your, your, your benefit, your choice. And so, um, on the whole, I would say that right-wing libertarians tend to be more thin libertarians, and left-wing tend to be more thick, uh, and you'll see, as I will sort of go in, how, they, how the, the idea is to combine a lot of different cultural values um, as a new identity and promote it through libertarianism. Now, right-wing libertarians do the same thing. They just do it in a different direction. Uh, but I think this is a, an interesting and a useful matrix uh, to think about as we get a bit deeper into this. So, in describing left libertarianism, um, oh yeah, so it's a great line here, right? These are my principles. If you don't like them, I have others. This is uh, not. Uh, this was this was coined by the the, the funny Marx Groucho, not his uh, unfunny, unrelated friend Carl. But uh, yes, he's the unfunny Marx brother. That's right. Yeah, Capital was not was not riveting. Um, but on this first slide, I'd like to explain that left libertarianism is a leftist ideological position. And so that means that they share many things with other leftists that you would naturally suppose, right? That they want to use ideas of class analysis and the idea of class struggle to foment revolutionary action. They think that's a useful frame to think about social and political dynamics as in terms of class structure, right? They're concerned about deep inequality, structural poverty, uh, they want to solve that through different types of wealth um, redistribution, right? They want to rely on grassroots solutions, mutuality, solidarity with each other, rather than relying on each, you know, a single person bootstrapping themselves up through hard work and God's grace and all that. We should be all to help each other, common safety net type of approach. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but they have a whole catalog of concerns that they share commonly with leftists, Marxists, progressives, socialists, greens of other types. But they differ with other leftists in very strong ways because most leftists that are not of these groups are statists, right? And so they actually want to use the state to create their outcomes, right? They don't like the current arrangement of income and wealth in society. Well, we're going to solve that with you know, laws and punishments and dictates. Right? We don't like that certain people are oppressed versus others. Well, we're going to expropriate from them and we're going to give to the other, right? And so left libertarians differ with other leftists in that they affirm very strongly the necessity and the value of property. And property is a source of personal and communal power, 
right? I have my property and I can defend it. We collectively, you all own property and we can pool it together and we can have economic resources to marshal for our goals that we wanna, we wanna solve, solve problems, right? They differ with, the, with other leftists that freed markets would be equalizing, that they would entail a more diffuse arrangement of power in society, that free markets are not some Randian fantasy of hypercapitalists lording it over the rest of society, digging in the, you know, scratching in the dirt for pennies, which is what a lot of leftists, you know, sort of have this perception, right? Left libertarians give different explanations for persistent injustice and economic problems, right? They attribute that to state privilege, to elites, right? We talk about, you know, we call it crony capitalism. We call it regulatory capture. Well, they have the same terms, right? But in, in their leftist framework, the current persistent problems, whether that's uh, social, cultural, racism, sexism, whether it's economic problems, whether it's environmental problems, these things are derived, f f rooted in state behavior, not in uh, some kind of organic problem with markets or freedom. And so that differentiates them from other leftists. They suggest other solutions to solve those problems. And what's interesting and important to me is that they view the ruling class going to use that term, talking about class analysis, right? The, the ruling class is a combination of both wealthy capitalist elites and a powerful state. And so this is very important, right? And we sort of see this as well, right? You know, I consider Raytheon and Boeing and Lockheed Martin as part of the ruling class, right? I consider the Federal Reserve as part of the ruling class. I consider all the various, you know, one degree removed from the state trough as ruling class. Even if they're not technically agents, they're still economically connected and they benefit and they support and, pro and they promote it. And so I think it's a useful way to think about it that differs from the way that typical leftists view this ruling class as its technology billionaires and capitalist elites of different types and oil barons and, and so on and so forth, but the state agents themselves are all you know, kind-hearted saints looking out for our best interests. You know, that's naive. And at the same time, left libertarianism is a libertarian ideological position. And so they are, of course, concerned with the idea of equality of authority, that nobody has superiority over anybody else. They're concerned with property rights, liberty, and peace, just like all libertarians are. And they share with other libertarians the notion that violence can be used to defend property, licitly. Now, they don't like the word property. They're a little bit allergic to it, so they call it just possessory claims. Whatever. It's the same thing. They agree that peace and free trade are the path to wealth, prosperity, and social harmony. Right? They believe markets are naturally coordinating. They believe in spontaneous order. Right? They embrace freedom and voluntarism in all forms, and that the state is the root of all current evils and opposing protectionism, monopolization, regulation, warfare, conscription, all of that. Now, of course, they differ with typical libertarians, in my view, that, as I said before, tend to be a little more conservative uh, and right-leaning. and right -leaning. They differ with other libertarians in that they make different predictions about what freedom will make. And so we all have some notions of what a free society might look like. And maybe you think it's the world as it exists just right now today, just minus the state. And so you're just, the world, it's all the same, you're just going to get 25% more to save on your taxes. Right? Maybe you think that it'll end war, and so you think it'll have well some comp you know implications for immigration or for this or for that, right? Or think about intellectual property or think about you know inflation and money, right? We can imagine it's hard it's hard to imagine out what are all the uh, second and third order and fourth and fifth order effects of what a free society would look like. But in reading um, in reading Rothbard's um, For a New Liberty and in reading Friedman and in reading Hoppe and reading, you know, what I would consider more standard right-wing libertarians, the vision they have is actually pretty different than what Johnson and Chartier and Long and some of the left libertarians propose, and, and I can get into that in a bit, in a bit later. Another thing that they differ on is some of the consequences of freedom. So that ties in a little bit with the first part, but we tend to think about when we have a free society, we'll have more money, we'll have more wealth, look at the way the state steps on us, look at how we could be growing otherwise without them. And for the left libertarians, again, 
as leftists, they are very concerned about deprivation, about exclusion, about subordination, about these, these you know, the marginalized, underserved classes. And so a lot of their focus is on how does the state get in the way of people solving for poverty? How does the state promote racial and sexual and social divisions? How does the state despoil and destroy the environment? And so thinking through and, and, and exploring how all of that gets cleaned up in some sense in a free society is a bit of a different focus than some of the more narrow economic implications that I think we tend to focus on. Uh, they differ also in that they explain current economic outcomes um, with a bit more of a skeptical eye than we do as a result of state action and not necessarily you know, individual heroic achievement. And so I think that we do fall into a bit of a blind spot as libertarians where we, where we sometimes will talk about the free market in this kind of abstract, principled way, but then we will talk about some situation in the world as if those are the same. And I think that a lot of the organization in our economy and a lot of who is on top and who makes money and what industries are successful or not is contorted by all sorts of state privilege. And that state privilege is in, in very deep ways, not just little regulations here and there, but in the notion of intellectual property, right? What would Disney be if it didn't have intellectual property laws, right? The idea of the corporate form itself as a form of, as a sort of limited liability joint stock company, that is a state privilege, right? The state protects organizations of people to be able to do business without full liability in these ways. So these things are very deep privileges and they produce very deep distortions. And so the left libertarian standpoint suggests that what we see today as the status quo economic arrangement, we should really be thinking of it as the status quo. And we should be more open to the possibilities of how, how the markets would evolve and change outside of these deep privileges. Um, they have a lot to say about rectification of historical injustice, right? Problems of land theft, problems of stolen property, problems of despoilation and, and usurpation of indigenous peoples, right? And as libertarians, we're all good Lockeans, I hope, right? Well, I think we should all have a, have a prima facie belief that people who live in a place own that place and they develop it and they have their culture and language and all these things, but there's a lot of, uh, there's not a whole lot of activity, right? I, I don't hear a lot in normal libertarian circles about returning Texas to Mexico, right? Or about returning the Plains to the Plains Indians and about all sorts of these things. But these are massive, it's a sort of massive, all sorts of land theft, right? And now we're 200 years later, 500 years later, it's impossible to work it all out. You know, it's not a realistic problem, I think, for now. But there is a lot of focus on remedying a lot of this historical injustice on proper libertarian terms. Right, it's not. It's not just you know, you know, whining in a certain sense, which I, I imagine that a lot of it feels like when leftists do that. Um, that bothers me too, but I think there are good libertarian reasons for supposing that the world isn't divvied up the way that in principle it should be. And that people who own things, uh, control things, don't actually own them. So moving on. Um, I'd like to explain a bit of some more concrete ideas. So explaining their leftist positions and explaining their libertarian positions produces some interesting outcomes. And so one of the, uh, one of the very interesting thoughts uh, from the left libertarian literature is the variety of economic structures that they propose may emerge in a free society. And so there is a, there is a concept, um, there is a, a, a notion, it's sort of a, a basic notion of a lot of their thinking, that markets are actually very equalizing. That markets don't concentrate wealth, they dissipate it. And so the notion that markets concentrate wealth, this is a Marxist conception, right? That the rich get richer, the powerful get powerfuler, and so on until there's just one man stepping on the world. Well, when you look at markets uh, in, in, in a more general and empirical sense, they actually, it's, it's difficult to maintain that kind of control and power and wealth without all sorts of ways of being propped up, without that wealth being protected, right? And so 
when freedom is introduced, let's say, in a region, or when there's more freedom after certain government situations fall, I'm thinking of like the post-Soviet Union, for instance, there was a, dramatically a, a lot of wealth creation after the time, but it was more distributed across different groups and different peoples. Uh, and so the argument is that when we see concentrations, they are due to state protections like intellectual property and like the corporate form. And there's some interesting economics that would support this idea as well. So we're familiar with the concept of economies of scale, right? The idea that uh, I can improve my output with more raw material using a certain known process up, up to a point, right? I can, I can improve my, out, my productive output by consolidating resources together in space or in time or in certain ways to produce output. Well, economies of scale also turn into diseconomies of scale. And this is not really discussed very much. Uh, I found Rothbard discussing it in some little section of man economy and state, but it's not really discussed very much. But diseconomies of scale are a real thing, that you get so large that you actually cannot uh, move not just as nimbly as you used to be able to, but you actually suffer from an output standpoint because you suffer in information and in calculational ways. So you know, thinking about vertical you know, integration, uh, a company that vertically integrates its production process all the way from the raw material to the intermediate goods to the finished goods and, the, and they sell it, the more companies vertically integrate, the more calculational chaos there is in there. So if folks understand what economic calculation works and how that is, you have to have market prices and f to determine factor prices to know if you're making a profit. Well, the larger companies get, and the more that they absorb elements of the market and they internalize them, the more blind they are actually to be able to do that kind of calculation. Um, and so they become sort of islands of calculational chaos. So if you guys are familiar with von Mises' socialist calculation argument, uh, he basically argued that in a socialist economy, they can't rationally allocate because they don't have markets and they can't price anything and it's just sort of chaos of picking whatever the bureaucrats think should be made. Well, Rothbard makes a very astute point that this is also true in, uh, in firms, in enterprises, right? Because firms are internal organizations that don't price out every single intermediate good in their, in their company. And so until, unless, they have factor, unless they have outside prices, they can't tell, should we make this or should we buy it? Or how, much, what, how profitable is each sector of the, of the production process? And so the more that companies get larger, the more that they run into these sort of calculational informational problems uh, and they actually become less effective. They start, they start losing. They, they don't make profits, they make losses instead. So there are natural upper limits to the size of firms uh, that good standard Austrian economics will describe. And so the left libertarians look at that and they, and they feel like, okay, well, if it weren't for all the protections and privileges, then the economic society would actually be a lot smaller and flatter than what we currently have today. And so there's this expression, let markets eat the rich, right? The idea is that it's very hard to become rich and very hard to stay rich uh, if you don't have these protections. And so given that kind of view of industrial organization, they suggest that people would adopt more congenial ways of working. And so a lot of people are familiar with working in a corporation, you know, working in a, a big company, working in a cube farm, having bosses and bosses and bosses and all that. I mean, I, I, that's my experience, at least for a lot of my work and career. Um, and part of the reason that I do that is because that corporation can offer me a large salary. And part of the reason they can offer me a large salary is because they don't have a lot of competition in whatever product they do. Now, maybe that's because uh, it's extremely niche and narrow. In my case, that's, that's not true. It's because of intellectual property laws and other types of ways that they could regulate and prevent competition to get this artificial, artificial benefit. And so I can work at a large megacorp and earn a huge income, um, but I have to trade a lot to do that. And those are things I'd rather not trade, actually. There's things like my dignity. Right? There's things like my autonomy, like my time, right? like my peace of mind. Right? You know, People commute all the way back and forth to go work in a box in a box, and they don't see daylight except for when they come in. They don't even see it when they leave. And the way that they're treated is not just subordinate in some kind of uh, obvious 
hierarchical system of the person that is above you knows more, and so you should probably do what they say. It, employees are treated subordinate in a sort of degrading way, in an unnecessary way. But this is itself a cultural outcome of this kind of deformed market industrial organization. And so if these large companies and corporations didn't benefit from these privileges, they would suffer and die or scale down in some sense to f meet the optimum firm size that they should be. And individual people like us would adopt alternate working arrangements. And so the left libertarians suggest these things would be like worker cooperatives. They might be industrial syndicates. They might be little family shops. They might be little free agency entrepreneurship, micropreneurship type, type of stuff. They might be communities or communes, right? They would in some sense be smaller and flatter groups that allow us more human engagement uh, rather than just being a pure human cog in a machine as a, as a mercenary for a company. Um, and so this is one of their predictions uh, that freed markets, freed from government you know, protection and strangulation in different ways would not become hyper unequal where you would have domineering titans of industry and huge skyscrapers and everybody else is again scratching in the dirt, but again, that it would reduce down and become, a, that there would be prosperity delivered in some sense to a wider berth rather than captured more at the top. When it comes to activism and strategies for freedom, they differ with traditional libertarians as well, in that they embrace more direct action type of work. And so um, there's a lot that is common with other groups, so I didn't want to include everything, but, so, but sort of what's specific is that you read folks like Carl Hess or, or Samuel Edward Konkin, and they are very opposed to political action. And they're opposed to political action as a form of activism uh, because they feel it's unethical, right? They feel that actually casting a ballot to oppress just others in this way against me, right? Uh, they feel that it's, that it's actually oppositional to libertarian ethics. But beyond that, that it's just absurd. That the state is not gonna end itself because you petitioned through its systems for it to do so. This is not going to, there's no, there's no road to freedom. There's no there there, right? There's a dead end for freedom. Um, and the idea is that instead of anarchy, right, this kind of gradual chipping away, we're going to get to a limited small government, we're going to get to some night watchman state, we're going to get finally to some little anarchy, right? Instead, what you get is partyarchy. You have, you know, rule by political party instead of rule by, you know, self-governance. Uh, and, you, and you have this sort of perpetual grind for little gradual improvements, little gradual things here and there, and that occupies a tremendous amount of energy, occupies a lot of, a lot of people's energy and a lot of their hopes. Um, and people get very burned out on that, um, and with other types of activism too. But instead of political action, which they regard as a sort of reactionary and conservative approach, they would have you embrace agorism. And agorism uh, is, is a type of economic behavior that uh, is derivative from the word agora, Greek, uh, meaning sort of a marketplace or a common, a common arena. Uh, and so they would, have you shift economic activity from your licit normal white markets into black and gray markets and to promote uh, underground economies. Uh, one, number one, is a privacy measure so that you are uh, out of the eye of Sauron from a surveillance standpoint, from a government surveillance standpoint, but also as counter economics viable counter-economic activism itself, right? By engaging economically with black and gray markets, you deprive the state of tax revenue, you deprive them of information about the exchange, and you ultimately deprive their ability to regulate you. So this is a way of sort of dissolving the state's apparatus of economic control from the bottom up. Now, this was a, a big source of conversation and debate in the 1970s, um, and Rothbard he sort of argues that agorism is not really scalable beyond, you know, buying drugs or doing, helping your neighbor and doing little things like that, uh, and that industry and large commerce and large logistics, they're just too visible. They're just way too vulnerable to the state. If they don't pay taxes or if they have stuff off the books, it's just unbelievably way too risky for the chief officers of the companies to do any of that, um, which, is, which is a good, which is, which is a valid objection. Um, 30 years later, 40 years later, what we have now 
is private cryptocurrency that really allows, in my view, for global agorism, where now you don't have to know the person right next to you and you have to trust them and you're substituting a surveilled state white market economy for some kind of trust-based underground economy, uh, you can use currency that won't reveal all sorts of information about you, and you can have economic arrangements across the world instantaneously. And so I see Bitcoin, um, and especially more other types of more private coins, as facilitating the new form of 21st century global agorism that I think ultimately will be successful. In, in dissolving and undermining the ability for states to, to surveil their population from an economic standpoint, um, and a lot of the power that accrues to them from that basis. Uh, so some final thoughts I have in sharing all this information with you is that even though right and left libertarians have different, perhaps even opposing cultural values, this really shouldn't preclude useful cooperation between people and between groups. Right? So I think about Rothbard working with the anarcho-communist Murray Bookchin and joining the New Left in the 1960s. Um, and he did a lot of work with um, different types of left groups, everything from, what was it, like Black Power, like Black Panther groups, uh, to Greens, um, and anybody that he could find that would help to undermine the state and help him with the specific movement he wanted to make in his political activist career. I think there's important knowledge for the right to learn from the left. Specifically, I think sociology, ecology, and, anth and anthropology, which are typically dominated by left-wing type people, will be very important knowledge uh, because that is critical for understanding how systems work, how societies work, how ecosystems work, uh, and, and our, our organization, our, 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 our political society, our economy, these things are organic ecosystems. So it's important to understand these topics. And I think it's important for the important knowledge for the left to learn from the right, specifically economics, political science, history, which they typically don't know, um, which would inform their goals and their values and their and their outcomes. And so I believe that libertarians, whether right or left, should work together to reduce the state by making either specific little political coalitions on on little targeted ventures, by supporting complementary types of activism, maybe that's Occupy, maybe that's other types of um, you know mutual aid groups, uh, and by allowing some flexibility with each other in small cultural ways for our common goal. And so um, th that's that's sort of my last my last thought is that I have I have more thoughts about how to work with people on the left, how to market, how to speak to them, how to understand them, and use language that will support people working together, um, because right and left are allergic to each other but I don't think they need to be. And I think as libertarians, we need all the help that we can get from people that are already in some sense on the boat, they're just on the port side and we're on the starboard side. So this is my final slide, is just some resources. If you'd like to learn more about market anarchism, libertarian socialism, left libertarianism, these are all, these are all sort of synonyms, then I can suggest these thinkers, these books and these websites to you. Thank you very much. So I have a bunch of questions. Uh, let me start. <laughs> uh, first one, uh, did I understand you correctly that left libertarians also share the non-aggression principle? Yes, yes, that's okay. right. Okay, and uh, did I understand you correctly that thin libertarian, it's actually cannot be left or right because it's just non-aggression principle, nothing else? Yeah, technically you're right. So people will still, be left or right in their own personal ways, but they wouldn't be, they wouldn't demand that if you're gonna be, if for you to be a libertarian, you have to support this program or support this program. So I would consider Walter Block to be on the right, but he is thin, he doesn't insist that libertarianism itself means anything more, anything more than that. So you could be on the left, uh, you know, it could be a left libertarian, but still be a thin because you don't need other libertarians to agree with your cultural values. Okay. Uh, just to confirm, uh, so it means that when they speak about wealth redistribution, uh -huh. they use that wealth redistribution just inside the private jurisdiction, inside the own community, which anybody can live and uh, won't be uh, 
affected by the internal uh, rules of wealth redistribution. So wealth redistribution, I didn't, I didn't spend much time on it, but that is understood as a non-aggressive mechanism. So what kind of? <laughs> so the idea that um, if we feel that certain elites have too much power, that we would we would boycott them, or we would workers would strike on those companies. We would take power in certain ways that doesn't involve the state robbing them. So the idea of ending sort of state privileges and letting the letting more competition enter the market and equalizing equalizing prosperity is itself a kind of wealth redistribution. It's just done on free and appropriate terms. It's not a robbery. It's just ending the, ending the support that people have for their unjust wealth. So th there could also be communities that are democratic that will take a vote to take from Peter to give to Paul. Maybe that's true too. But when I read wealth redistribution from these people, they are talking about in general market-based ways, not in, not in state coercive ways. I hope that answers that question. So you, uh, you talked about um, lefties viewing markets, left libertarians viewing markets as a force that disperses wealth. Yes. And not one that concentrates it. Yes. Right libertarians view markets as a system that creates wealth. Yes. Uh, and kind of tend to have a conception that like humans, human wealth is a thing that started at zero and we have built every inch of. Yeah, yeah. Do they have a like comparable theory of wealth or that have any conception of markets creating wealth and not just redistributing it in some way? Yeah, yeah, no, it's very similar. Um, right, I mean, we start at primitive ground zero and there are, you know, anarcho-primitivists that I would that w I would consider to be on the left, that would regard agriculture and civilization as horrible and destructive, and we should go back to the trees and all that. But excluding primitivists from the discussion, I think libertarian socialists do recognize that trade and production and property and organization produces human wealth. It's just a, a, an argument over where does it end up at the end of the day. So I think they share the same kind of classic liberal. Lockean story, you know, Misesian story about we're all, you know, scratching in the dirt thousands of years ago when we discover iron and how to work peacefully and now we're all wealthy. Um, the argument is more about like, well, how much, of, how much of the arrangement, how much of the distribution of that today is a function of state privilege versus benign inevitable market forces? And, they sort of, and they'd come down on the, on the former, on the, you know, on the former on that one. Um, <clears throat> I, I liked your uh, diagram of uh, you know thin and thick libertarians and yeah. left and right. How do you think that relates to uh, Thomas Sowell's you know uh, constrained and unconstrained visions? How, how does that map, or, or does it map at all? What do you think? A little bit. Um, that's a good question. I haven't thought about. I haven't read that book for some ten years. Um, I would say the. So I think that maps more to left, right than thick, thin. So I think the left as a whole has, an, has the unconstrained vision um, because I think the left as a whole tends to view, has more of a sort of blank slate view of humanity um, than the right. Um, I, think the, I think the left is more nurture and the right is more nature on that debate, if I can put it that way. And so I think that lends itself to how constrained is your vision for what humanity can become. Um, I think there's there's exceptions there. I could probably we could probably contrive for some right wing unconstrained vision about the world, and we could probably discover some left wing constrained vision in certain ways. But just on the top of my head, I would say it maps more to left to right than thick first thin. Yeah. Uh, hey, thanks for the talk. Really, really cool. Um, I. You, you one first statement I have is uh, you reminded me of the uh, of, of an experience I had years ago. Um, where you were talking about the, the Mises insight on vertical integration of corporations yep. and how there's a lack of efficiency at the bigger the company gets. Yep. Yep. And you reminded me of, um, I, I had a, a job I had to go to in New York City where there was um, IBM rented out this top floor, this huge building, um, to have this think tank that they set up. 
and I had to go shoot some interviews with some people. And I was like, so off camera, I was like, so what, what do you actually do here? And like, we don't know yet. <laughs> like, they just rented this office and put us all in here and just asked us to come up with something cool. Because yeah. that's how small think tanks get started. They come up with an idea, they all work together, and that's how innovation happens. I was like, so none of you actually <laughs> have any idea. No, no one has an idea. They just put us all here and asked us to come up with something. Yeah. And I just, while you were talking, I searched it up to see if it was still active. And shocker, it's not there anymore. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so that's a great example of vertical integration being horribly inefficient. Right. Instead of a market force pr providing an outlet for some good idea. Right. Um, second was, uh, I'm very interested in communication to the left, right, and left, and and getting people to uh, coordinate for common good. And one of the main issues, and you kind of touched on it, was that there's like an ideological acceptance that has to happen uh, to say like, do you accept all of my identities or whatever it is, uh, the tenets that I have in order for us to agree and work together. Yeah. And kind of like one of the basic fundamentals of being sort of a right leaning mind is that I do me, you do you, and then the thing that we work together on is our individuality. And I find it very difficult to, the, the, uh, to work together because I think that the left is very willing to have the right help them with an issue, especially like when libertarians come to help. Hmm. But it's never the opposite direction because they're not willing to work with anybody who has a uh, dissenting viewpoint because we don't accept something that they accept, therefore we can't help you achieve your goal. By they and we, you're talking. You're, you're saying that the left is seems um, more intolerant for the right helping them than for the right to accept help from the left. Or Correct. Kind of yeah, and I shouldn't have said they and we, but I was thinking kind of like you know, right leaning libertarians or so on and so you know the thin libertarians, sure. right leaning, and then you know left libertarians or, or left wing, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the left libertarians tend to be a bit more thick in their ideological commitments and the sort of cultural and philosophical commitments. Um, but I don't think that's insurmountable. Um, I guess I'd want to learn some particulars about how your, you know, your your experience or what you're describing to sort of to sort of answer it a bit more concretely. But I think that in my experience, talking with people on the left that are not libertarians necessarily. Um, maybe they're amenable to it because the word anarchist is kind of sexy and I'll, you know, I'll listen, you know. Um, there's definitely certain ways to pitch ideas and there's definitely certain ways to couch certain concepts and words that don't trip tripwires, don't step on landmines with them. Um, and the same is true with the right, you know. Um, I, I sort of know where those are too. Um, I'm just at less risk of tripping over those. Um, but I think that I think that there would be a useful I think I think it would be useful to establish like a common not like a meta language but like a global language that so we could actually discuss terms and have the same understanding about them and work together right but if if words are so polarized like capitalism right what does capitalism mean oh well of course capitalism means a system where every man gets to produce as much as he's capable of and keep the fruits of his labor and a free trade, free enterprise system, and it's all, it's all peaches and cream. It's like, well, that's not what it means to half the world or three quarters of the world or you know, a whole the other ideological camp. That's a system of rugged exploitation of the haves over the have-nots. And so it's like, well, we just can't even get anywhere using that term. And so there's a lot of things like that and a lot of ideological terms like that, I think that we just don't connect on, don't understand, can't, we don't really speak the same language in a certain way, and so it's hard to have trust with somebody of a different ideology that you actually have the same goals in mind, when sometimes you can't communicate and trust the communication is that efficacious. So I, I think there's a language problem. I think there may also be a temperament and a dispositional problem. Um, and that stuff I definitely didn't get into here, but I'm definitely influenced by Jonathan Haidt and a lot of their work on like, you know, the political orientation derives from personality traits and, you know, it's a whole, there's a whole literature on how left liberals differ from conservatives and libertarians from a, 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 a dispositional standpoint. So there's a lot more to be said about all of that. Um, we can talk more later if you want. I hope that, I hope that answered your question. Um.
So I was going to ask how, shit, that's loud. Uh, I was going to ask how you define leftism because, frankly, agorism is what, so if you think of leftism in common terms, it's often thought of as left versus right economics, which left economics isn't agorism. It's there's uh, all the markets are controlled. You have no voluntary trade and no private property. Whereas some, a lot of the leftism you described tonight is like two points short of my full 10 on the Sapley or Specker, you know? Sure. Um, so I'm wondering sure. how you define leftism and contrast it to Rothbardian or true laissez-faire yeah. um, economics. And I'll add in real quick, by the way, a note on capitalism. That was a term created by socialists, and I've stopped using it because the intention of it is to put the focus on property, whereas yeah. the real focus is obviously free markets and voluntarism. So just an interesting note on that term, but yeah. Sure, sure. Um, so I guess the way I'm using leftism, um, there isn't going to be a, lo a large difference in an economic sense because this group of leftists are free market oriented. So this group of leftist economics is going to be nine-tenths Rothbardian economics. Now, there's distinctions. So Kevin Carson and other folks in here uh, are coming up, come up with their own ideas. They try to reconcile labor theory of value with Austrian economics. There's a different types of mutualist economic uh, theories that are a bit different from what maybe we're familiar with. Um, what is it? Henry George has his own sort of sort of Georgism and different types of geolibertarian views on the nature of land and we should tax land but not property. And so there are little bits of different strands um, that would diverge from a pure you know, let's say pure Austrian standpoint. Um, but the way I use left in this presentation is really more cultural left. And so cultural left to me is marked by very strong empathic concern for those that don't have and are being, uh, uh, per, you know, seemingly, seemingly treated unfairly by the system, right? The people that stack up at the bottom of the hierarchical pyramid. The left is very concerned with that. And that's this group, and that's this group, and that's this group, and that's this group, and that's various reasons, right? The right isn't really that concerned with that. Like, there's concern about the, the whole hierarchy, and you want to climb, and you want to do what you can to be above, and to save, and to provide, and invest, and make sure you're higher. But from my standpoint, inequality, economic inequality, is probably like the major artery, or the major element of leftist cultural and economic thinking. Um, and the concern about the environment, or children, or animals, and the concern about you know you know the different you know ethnic minorities, and concern about different things, in some sense relates to perception of uh, a, a, a sort of temperament of empathy that these people are are being unfairly treated, and now we're going to get righteously angry about it and try to fix it. And I think there's merit to that. It just depends on the way you want to fix it. So. Um, I don't know if you, you know, I don't agree with all the objections, maybe, but I think, but that's where I'm coming from with the use of the word leftist here. Yeah, you're kind of leaning into what I kind of wanted to ask is like, what's the relationship between, you know, leftist libertarianism and equality? Like, mm. like, because it seems like a lot of left yes. sides really value equality. That's true. Um, I will say left libertarians on that exact turn are probably more libertarian than left and that the equality they promote is equality of authority rather than equality of outcome. Uh, the focus on how markets will alleviate poverty and the focus on how markets will disempower the elite titans that are strangling everyone and the, the focus on how markets will uh, provide uh, a horn of plenty for everyone that's been despoiled, that does hit on the equality bell a little bit, but they're not, uh, I wouldn't say they're communists necessarily. So like that is a range in there. Uh, and I didn't, you know, I didn't want to get into all the flavors and flags and colors and all yeah, that, whatever. Sure. Well, um, there's, there's a lot of varieties to it. So I think and comms are probably, I don't know, I don't know, a, a, a decent proportion, anarcho-communists are a decent proportion of libertarian socialists as a whole, but there's still a lot of individualist anarchists, still a lot of, you know, sort of market-based anarchists, uh, green anarchists, all sorts of things that just don't really care that much about making sure everyone is equally as tall as everybody else, you know? 
Um, but it is, it is there. It does exist. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm really excited that you were talking about this because I, uh, I was reading a lot of Nick Land this week. And if you go to his Wikipedia page, it's like maximum scare the hose. It's like inspired white nationalists and far right ideas. But then if you, if you go into some of his ideas, he's like looking at cybernetics and he's reading Deloise and Guattari, who are French Marxists. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of great, I, I agree with you, there's a lot of great ideas that we can learn from the left. And I'm wondering, uh, for libertarians, like, uh, how can we kind of functionally advance our ideas and not uh, have the right devour itself over the narcissism of small differences and maintain kind of functional uh, coalitions amongst ourselves and also be able to reach out to the left without having them be sk frightened of, of the right, so yeah. to speak? Um, yeah, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Well, that's a two-parter. Um, Sorry. So one of them, no, no, it's good. I mean, I, I think one of them is how do, how do, let's say, normal libertarians or h how do conservatives or people on the right connect with the left in a way that brings in value and knowledge and information and insight to support our own vitality, right? right. Um, and so this is, this is kind of like a, you know, uh, philosophical question about like the nature of borders almost it's like what, what, what why have borders what's the purpose of borders well because they protect you from disease and invasion and if you bring in the wrong thing you'll all die that's why you have borders well what do borders do well they also block everything out and so then you're going to choke and and suffocate and starve and die if you don't have any so there's this always like question of how poor should borders be conceptually, practically, culturally, because you want the new insight from the outside world to revivify you, but you don't want to bring in the pathogens and you don't want to bring in stuff that's going to harm you. And so it's always a it's always a difficult balance to strike there. I think that um, I think that, you know, for people on the right and you know, I think libertarians don't have too much to fear from reading leftist material. Right, reading some Noam Chomsky, right, or reading some, you know, Roderick Long or Carl Hess. Uh, this is a bit more familiar, right? If you if you're reading uh, if you're reading Lenin, you know, you, you might go extremely even not even libertarian at all. Then I don't know how valuable that might be, but I don't think there's that much harm in reading material from left libertarians and left anarchists or just leftists in general, because you will already be able to parse out what is an interesting insight or what is not. How does it fit into your global puzzle of how the world works and how society works? Um, but just the ways they think are different. And so there will be all sorts of novel solutions and insights to certain problems that you would not encounter just having, you know, sort of right, you know, uh, conservatives and right-wingers talk amongst yourselves about it. So I think, it, I think it's important to read that material and to engage with it. How to connect with the people so that they're not scared of us, maybe, or so they, you know, we're not all, it's like anyone to the right of Lenin is far right, and they won't talk to anybody, you know, it's like, well, I think you do that by making friends with them, and trying to find other common interests and common cause, and to demonstrate that you're a humane, intelligent, rational, good person, and hey, I'm going to leak a little bit of my ideas about certain things and see if you bite on it or not and see, you know, I don't want to step on your landmine. So, but, but you need some kind of alternative reason to be together and spend time together. And then you can be some leftist token libertarian friend. Yeah, totally. So on, a quick one on the subject of making friends. Um, so, uh, and this kind of relates to like the thick and thin libertarian yeah. aspect too is um, I think a common, common, uh, like landmines that the right trips on is uh, ethnicity and the trans question. Sure. So, so like everyone's for individual rights, but then you know, like the trans question is a really big political issue, and it's kind of growing. Yeah. And that kind of delves back into feminism as well. And then uh, with ethnicity, if you look at, for example, a lot of the pro-Palestinian protesters on the street, um, a lot of them are kind of leftist and disaffected youth. So a lot of people on the right will say, oh, we don't want anything to do with these people. They're all brown. They're all terrible. But, you know, maybe the best best-selling uh, Bitcoin book of all time is written by Palestinian. So you can't throw everybody out because you saw a couple of videos and you decide that everyone's bad. So sure, how sure. do we uh, make friends but also keep the barking dogs in our coalition from uh, destroying everything? Oh, that's hard. 
Um, I have that same problem too. I don't know. Um, because I have friends on the left um, that I admire and I like very much, but they have their own weird, radicalized distortions about what the right is or what libertarianism is. And it's like, no, 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 you gotta get off Twitter. You gotta get off, don't stop watching the news, stop watching the whatever. So I have to sort of like remind them like, no, 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 I'm humane and reasonable. I'm not like a crazy person that you had this label was attached to. Um, I don't know how to stop them from polluting their own conception of what those terms mean. All I can do is try to be as reasonable and you know, uh, intelligent and handsome as I can be uh, and hope that I crowd out their distortions of what I believe rather than I'm the, I'm the exception. I want to be the rule rather than the exception in their mind. Um, yeah, that's a hard problem to solve because you don't control what other people put in their mind in terms of what images they make. So probably a good solution would be to um, not leak your labels and identifiers and what you believe and who you are until you've established a lot of friendship capital. So if you're trying to make friends and meeting new people at the gym or at a dance class or at a meetup or whatever, you don't want to, you're like, hi, I'm Tony, right-wing libertarian, and I believe this thing. You know, it's like, you don't want to do that. And so, you know, you want to establish genuine harmony and, and genuine social connection, and they get to like you and be interested in you and what you do for work and what you do for what kind of video games you play, whatever, whatever. And then it's like three months later, you might have a comment about like, oh, did you see this thing on the news? Yeah, I don't know what you think about that. So I would just tread, tread slowly is what I would do. I think we have four more questions, okay. and, then, and then that's it. We're cutting it off at that point. OK. Uh, you, you sort of alluded to uh, one. This is a really easy one. So I was going to ask you, where do you fit on the thick, thin, left, right? <laughs> OK? And yeah. then the second question is, uh, do or can uh, these two different uh, sides of uh, libertarianism, can they get along better than what we have with the current left and right divide? Yeah, I think so. So on the first question, um, I am inclined to punt. Um, I am more thin than I am thick. Um, I do tend to feel that libertarianism is sort of its own standalone ethical philosophy, that you don't need a whole bunch of associated cultural and philosophical baggage on it to be true. Um, but there is a great chapter. I brought it up here in case anybody wants to peek and take a look. This is Markets Not Capitalism. It's a great collection of essays on left libertarianism. There's a great chapter in here that Charles Johnson writes. It's very persuasive about why libertarianism is part of a larger bundle of freedom and revolutionary behavior and human, and human uh, emancipation and things like that that spills out in different directions. Um, I sort of appreciate it intellectually, but I don't, it, doesn't, it doesn't sit in my stomach or my heart, I guess. Um, in terms of left or right, I am probably in the middle. So I'm probably centrist libertarian. So I definitely have very strong positions that would make me orient me to the right. Uh, and I have strong positions that would orient me to the left. So we'll just take the average, we'll just call me a centrist. Um, in terms of would they get along better, I think that is true than standard right or left. So uh, I remember going to, uh, I mean, there are different events and conferences where you'll see both, right? So I used to go to Porkfest for a number of years up in New Hampshire. Um, and that is more of a, you know, gun toting, you know, but also weed smoking. And so there's a lot of sort of mix there. And so there were all sorts of booths and tables where people would hand out Alliance of the Libertarian Left little zines and pamphlets, and they would talk about crypto, and they'd talk about different ways of doing direct action, civil disobedience and things, and, uh, and there was some fraternity there. You know, there was some dispute and disagreements uh, there, but also they were all there for this event to support each other and support reducing and ending the state. And there were sometimes our left libertarian booths at, you know, I've seen, I, it wasn't like, I don't think it was YAL, uh, but maybe like Students for Liberty or other types of things. I've seen I've seen Booth there handing out little agorist, you know, pamphlets and things like that. So it does exist. Um, I think if you get a couple beers in, then they're going to be just as hostile to each other as regular right and left. So. Uh, so regarding left um, culture, besides wealth redistribution, which I call socialism, uh, yes. they also have another big um, 
culture point, what is, I would call, global warming. They believe that they can use force to uh, protect yep. uh, environment. Sure. And uh, from my point of view, for example, CO2 is harmless. From their point of view, they can consider as poison. Sure. So how it, how right and left libertarians with such big difference on uh, on <laughs> this kind of aspect, how they can, can coexist? Because one of them can consider this gas as harmless yeah. and another considers them as poison. Well, I mean, if force is off the table, then it doesn't really matter what people believe. Um, well, I guess for general leftists, it's not off the table. So from a left libertarian standpoint, it is off the table. So if leftists are concerned that industrial pollution is accelerating the heat death of the planet and they want to, uh, you know, pass laws and regulations to prevent that, install that, and buy time from that happening. Um, I mean, that relies on their perception of the biological and scientific and chemical reality about the situation. Maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, I don't know. But it also relies on their willingness to use the state as an organization to accomplish what they believe is right. And so if the state if the state is not asked to do that kind of work, right? Like, I don't think the people here, you know, that I'm listing and, and, and describing their philosophy, they don't support state aggression for pollution control. So whether we agree or disagree about the role of CO2 and what it does, it's, it's sort of like, do you, do you think the COVID vaccine was effective or not? Well, it's just a, it's just a dispute, but if there's no state forcing people to get, you know, mandated vaccines, then it doesn't have any teeth. It's just a different dispute. Like, do you think, you know, if gays get married, is that harmful to the culture? It's just another little dispute that they'll never agree on, and that's okay. I think it becomes a problem when they organize the state to, you know, uh, punish people for violating their views and their feelings on that. So... How could there be free market solutions to environment, to climate change and environmental other problems? There's different, you know, books and different chapters on that. Um, there may actually be even one in here. I, I have to check. But I think the problem really is that the state as an apparatus of control is being co-opted by an opinion, one way or the other. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, okay. So uh, you brought up Chomsky earlier, and uh, he actually has one of my favorite interviews related to this whole subject ever, where yeah. he gets asked point blank. Um, so anarchist society, um, someone wants to contract themselves to do labor for someone else. Are you using force to stop them? And he essentially says, well, if someone really wanted to voluntarily sell themselves into slavery, I guess I wouldn't use force to stop them. Hmm. And that's kind of the, the, the heart of like what we're driving at with left libertarianism. The problem is you can read similar things in early like Lenin and Trotsky writings hmm. about the role of force in a communist society or in an anar in anarchist society. And so I just don't know that it makes any sense to believe them as much as they intellectually make arguments that make sense. By them, you mean leftists in general? Uh, left libertarians. That, like, when it comes, there's not a single one of them that, like, when people start getting put against the wall are going to not participate. <laughs> All of them. That's, pretty, that's a strong claim there. I don't know that I agree. Um, I think that there is, I think that there is a sense where voluntary socialists, voluntary communists, left libertarians historically have been co-opted by state communists, uh, and used as useful idiots or used as or pawns to promote, you know, 
Maoist and Stalinist regimes. Um, and so that's a uh, tragedy. Uh, but I think it's based off of them, maybe these, these situations you're talking about, left libertarians being a bit naive about where do their actual commitments lie. And so maybe intellectually, ideologically, they have strong commitments, but maybe they are not strong enough to back it up with their own guts and metal and lives. And so maybe that's, again, part of a dispositional difference, right? I don't think that they're intellectually hypocritical. I don't think that they're liars, right? They might just be cowards, that, you know? And so that would lead to the same outcome, right? Um, but I think, there's, I think also there's things to be said about right libertarians leading to different types of fascist regimes and governments in our you know, even more recent history than Lenin. Um, and it's like, well, was Friedman naive to go down to South America and some of this? It's like, well, I don't think so. But you know, again, he didn't have full control over what would happen you know, down there. Um, and so maybe the same story is with some of these left libertarians, left anarchists, they're not in control of when the tanks roll down the street, you know, all they have are little small small arms fire, and I can't really do much about it. So they're just going to get rolled up into the whole machine anyway. Um, it's a good point. It's a good point to make, though. Last question. Okay. So my question is actually kind of a follow up of that. Yeah. That I feel like a lot of the time there's always this fight for the true left. And that's been going on forever. So if we look at the original left-wing anarchists, Proudhon, Bakunin, they were actually pretty good. Yeah. And then, of course, we have Marx and Engels, who were just terrible. Yeah. We see that modern Joe Biden, Kamala Harris versus Glenn Greenwald and Julian Assange. Yeah, yeah. The same sort of distinction. And then we see that in the liberty movement with pretty much all the guys you have up here who are pretty much great. But then we look at people like the Nicholas Sarwarks of the world, Reason Magazine, Cato, Center for a Stateless Society, who get very sort of communist. Um, and to Andy's point about um, Chomsky, he was basically both. He was this really good left-wing anarchist who then became a Democratic Party shill. Sold out. Yeah. So, like, yeah. why does that seem to happen a lot? And how do you sort of see that? <laughs> how do you sort of see that, especially in the libertarian movement with things like Cato versus most of these guys, who are usually pretty good? Well, I mean, I think it's... I, I, don't, think, I don't think it's anything innate to the libertarian spirit or left or right, I think it's just opportunity. And people are, you know, penniless academics and they write little publications and newsletters for 30 years and then all of a sudden they become part of some political group or cabinet or something or they get some job in a think tank and they're asked to write about this or that or they're, or they're edited, they're changed. And so they... You just grow accustomed, I think, to the income and the wealth and the prestige and the status that they didn't have for a long time. Um, and they just sort of, you know, like, like, can you imagine a future you that's big and powerful and what he would think about you right now? You think, well, yeah, that was great back then, but now I really have it. I, bigger, powerfuler. Um, so I, 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 think, I, I think it's just a general problem of, of people selling out uh, their principles for earthly pleasure, you know? Um, and maybe there's something stronger that, that maybe that hits stronger for intellectuals than it does for, you know, people of the earth or working class or something else. Um, because I think that there is, I think, I think Hayek is right and Hoppe is right about sort of intellectual class is always a little bit envious. They didn't get they don't get the status they deserve because they're so smarter they're smarter than everybody else. But they're not they're bullied and cast down and they don't earn very much in university. And so I think finally when there's opportunity for them to join some kind of mega you know ideological organization or Politburo or Cato Institute, uh, those are all interchangeable. Um, then I think that I think a lot of them salivate at it and, and will will you know change their change their tune. So it's a sad it's a sad thing. That's our talk. Give it up for Mateus. Thank you everyone. <laughs>